All right. Welcome, everyone, to Traveling While Immunosuppressed, our um, third Ask an Expert webinar this year. My name is Kelly Helm, and I am the manager of patient engagement with NEFCURE. And I also have a 10-year-old daughter with FSGS. Um, just so glad that everyone is able to make it this evening. And um, before we jump in, I just have a few housekeeping items to go over. Um, those of you who are attendees are muted just to cut back on our feedback. Um, but I would like to make this an interactive webinar. So if you have questions as we go through our slides, feel free to raise your hands or you can also type your questions in on the GoToWebinar toolbar that you'll find at the top right of your screen. Um, if you don't see a toolbar, you should at least see a little arrow that kind of doesn't belong. If you click on that arrow, that should expand your toolbar there. And um, also, before we meet our panelists, um, just want to give you a little bit of information about um, our educational series here. You'll see over on the left our Ask the Expert webinar series. Our next webinar will be held on April 14th. And we'll be talking about uh, the importance of self-care for your mind and body. And um, I will go ahead and email out a link to register for that as a follow-up to this webinar. And also a new program that we started the first of the year is support group calls. And we have monthly support group calls, both for parents and caregivers, on the third Tuesday of each month and um, separate calls for adult patients on the first Wednesday of each month. And we do have a professional moderator who calls in and um, kind of keeps things flowing, but so far they've been very successful and I think very helpful for our uh, caregivers and our adult patients. All right, so um, before you meet our expert panelist, here's what you can expect from our time together this evening. Um, I am recording this webinar and we'll have a link to share afterwards. And I will also email out these slides to you. So don't feel like you have to jot all of this content down super fast. Um, you'll get a copy of your very own afterwards. And um, so basically, we're just going to talk about preparing to travel, um, what that entails, um, a few special considerations. We'll talk about air travel, public transportation, and international travel. I'll have resources at the end for you. And then, like I said, we can do some Q&A as we go, but also we'll have some time at the very end as well. All right, so we have two special guests on the call this evening, um, Shannon Kane and Jen Trunk. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce um, our expert patient parent, Shannon Kane. Shannon, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Shannon. I'm out here in California, and I'm mom to Ryan. You can see him in the little striped shirt up there. And um, he was diagnosed at age two and a half with minimal change, and we've been dealing with that for about three years now. Very good. Thank you. And next, I'd like to introduce our adult patient expert, Jen Trunk. Hi, everybody. Uh, as Kelly said, I'm Jen. I have FSGS. I uh, was diagnosed about 10 years ago. I received a transplant November 3rd of 2015, but unfortunately FSGS came back, so we're still dealing with it. Um, I have a seven-year-old daughter as well, and we travel um, quite a bit on a personal level, and I do do some travel for work as well. Wonderful. Thank you very much. So how this will work is I'll go through our slides, and Shannon and Jen are going to kind of interject and add their um, two cents and tips from their travel experiences. So 
So the first step in traveling, especially with a chronic illness or while taking immunosuppressive medications, is to plan of plan ahead and hopefully minimize the risks um, of traveling. So the first thing you want to do is evaluate your health or your child's health if you're a parent. Um, you may want to talk to your doctor who can help you assess your health and assess the risk of disease exposure or um, talk to you about how well your immune system can fight off disease. Next, you want to um, consider the best location for your family during that particular stage um, of your struggles. And one thing I wanted to ask Shannon to share is just in regular conversation, she had mentioned to me that they recently had to kind of make a decision um, of traveling out of the country or kind of stay in the States. So Shannon, do you want to go ahead and talk about why you chose to stay in the States this year for your family vacation? Yeah, yeah. My son, um, after about 13 months of remission, just recently had a relapse and we were planning spring break travel and the thought of him, you know, going to some small tropical island nation on heavy doses of steroids with limited hospital access. I just was not comfortable with that this year. And um, I may be accused of being a little unadventurous by my spouse, but um, I just felt like we needed to stay close enough to home, um, close enough to some good medical centers. So we're kind of staying in the state and doing a little ski trip this year instead of the tropical Caribbean island. Great. Thank you. Yeah, it's kind of nice to hear other parents or patients that are having to make those tough decisions because you hate to feel like the disease controls your everyday life. But in some cases, it kind of does control things like that. So it's just nice to know for some of us that we're not the only ones having to make those hard choices. Um, and sometimes that might mean... Um, giving up a tropical island for snow. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right. So the next tip is to um, definitely plan, plan travel outside of cold and flu season, if at all possible. I know sometimes travel around the holidays is imminent, but um, if you're planning a big trip, um, it's wise for those of us who are suppressed to plan travel outside of that cold and flu season that just minimizes your risks. It's also smart to consider the best mode of transportation. Um, if you can drive, there's probably you're probably less likely to be exposed to germs of um, the airport or train and public transportation. I also put on here to set clear expectations of family and friends who you'll be traveling with or visiting. I know um, sometimes it's hard for family and friends to completely grasp the magnitude of being immunocompromised. Um, so it's just always nice to be clear and concise with them and let them know um, what your expectations are. As if their family is sick, please don't come or um, stay away if you're ha if you have a sore throat or just communicate um, is and I was going to check with Jen or Shannon if you if you have experience having to do that my mother arrived with a pretty nasty cold one time and I mean we were still in the very early stages and I just kind of told her you know for 48 hours I just I need to book you a hotel nearby not that we don't love you, but I just cannot deal with him getting something right now. And, you know, she was a little sad that, you know, she flew all the way across the country and now she was at the days in down the road. But, um, you know, she got it. She understood. Good. I, for, for me, after post-transplant, I think everybody has totally stayed away from me. They're terrified of getting me sick this point. So I, I, I would kind of welcome a visitor sometimes. 
I haven't had the issue that uh, that Shannon's had so far. I think it. I, I think it. It sounds to me like it's going to be a lot different for an adult patient than possibly a child patient. Um, I guess my my tolerance for risk is probably different than it would be for a child. I'd probably be the same way if I had a child with with one of these diseases. But myself, I'm probably a little bit less risk adverse. Yeah, that's actually a really good point, Jen. You're willing to put yourself in a little bit more risk than maybe parents are of their kids, which yeah, actually I never thought of. But that's that's a really good point. Um. Also, there are special considerations, obviously, if you're traveling internationally, and we will talk about that later on this evening. Um, it's also a good idea to create a medical care plan. Um, we'll talk also about this a little bit more. Um, but basically, have a plan for the what-ifs, uh, if you get a fever, that type of thing. And then also consider taking extra medications, or at least plan ahead on your refills if you need to call and get them filled a little bit early. Um, I know that you can get an exception from insurance, or you may need to get, depending on the duration of your stay, a couple months supply versus just your regular 30 days. All right, so just some special um, considerations that you'll need to take when traveling. And this is, we're talking like a, a trip, maybe not necessarily for just a weekend, but if you're taking a long trip and traveling out of state, um, you definitely want to travel with your medications in their original containers. Um, and that's a definite must, especially on um, if you're flying. But we'll talk about that again later. Uh, make sure you have extra medications. We just talked about that. And then also it's smart to carry um, a list of your medications from your doctor if possible. Um, something that I tend to carry is a, the like a discharge papers. If when my daughter Macy gets discharged from the hospital, they'll print out a list of meds and have you sign them. And so that's easy just to stick on the fridge when we get home and it's there to grab should we need to go anywhere. Next, um, we'll talk about medical equipment. Um, you definitely wanna to plan to keep your medical equipment and supplies with you at all times during travel and obtain a medical letter of necessity from your doctor that basically states why you have that equipment and its use. Um, and this again is more important if you're traveling through the air or crossing uh, borders. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, and also Jen, Jen, I know that you traveled with quite a bit of medical equipment. If you wanna interject here or you can wait and talk about it if it's more relevant when we go into the specific types of travel? Uh, <clears throat> we can talk about it during, when we talk about the airplane travel, that was the most, um, that's probably where it's more important than it is just for like a weekend car trip. Okay, perfect. Next, um, there's definitely special considerations for emergencies. Um, it, it's nice to have a plan of action um, as to which hospital will be the best option for you. Um, I know whenever we start to plan a trip, the first thing I do is just in my brain, think of uh, which children's hospital will be close to there, just in case. Um, and again, we travel with a letter with contact information and instructions from our doctor, um, which basically says, please call her for instructions. <laughs> so, um, and then it's nice to have a medical alert bracelet on yourself or your child um, with your actual doctor's number on it. People are always asking, what should I put on my medical ID bracelet? And I really think the most valuable thing to put on there is, well, obviously medications and allergies, but your nephrologist number, because who's the most knowledgeable about you is probably your nephrologist. 
I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to interject here, Kelly. This is Jen. Um, I have a medical alert bracelet. Um, I got one. Well, I had one before with just FSGS, um, and then when I was on dialysis, I changed it, and I have another one now with uh, transplant on it. I didn't put my doctor's name on it. I actually just put my husband's because I was concerned that doctors would change as I went through this whole process. Um, but at the same time, I mean, I tried to educate my husband on everything he needed to know so that he had all that information. So he had my doctor's emergency phone number, um, all my medication information and all that too. So, um, but, I, but I did on my bracelet put, you know, FSGS and also kidney transplant on there so that they, they at least knew that. And I put my husband's name on it instead of um, my doctor's. Yeah. Just so I didn't know. And I think that the, the end goal is the same, just to make sure that they can get a hold of somebody that has a clue as to your medical considerations. I, I even one time when I when I the first time I traveled internationally, I had written, uh, I guess, a letter essentially, kind of trying to summarize the past ten years years of my medical uh, nightmare into a, a one page sheet, kind of so that. If for some reason something happened that I was unresponsive, and I could, my husband would have that and would be able to give it to anybody in an ER, and they could be brought up to speed. Because the scariest place to be is an ER where no one has any idea, and then they see your kidney numbers, and they all start freaking out. Yeah, very good point. Uh, that made me think your one-page over ten-year medical history. They actually oh. they they actually make USB medical bracelets where like the USB connects the bracelet. Yeah. Around your wrist, which for some of us might actually be a good idea. <laughs> Probably more necessary. <laughs> yeah. All right. And the last special consideration is insurance. It's always a good idea to have your insurance card with you. Um, it's also nice if you're taking a trip to know which facilities accept your insurance. Um, just to kind of alleviate the stress if there is an emergency. Um, and also, I should have put in there to know your coverages, just so that if somebody walks in and tries to collect money from you, you can either say, I have a copay, or I think I'd rather you bill me, that type of thing. Um, and then also, especially if you're traveling internationally, to obtain adequate insurance coverage. Um, so that you're covered there and you can get back without um, incurring large expenses. All right, so these are all kind of um, self-explanatory and um, just steps you can take to stay healthy, drink lots of water and stay hydrated. Um, Get enough rest if possible. Uh, avoid excessive amounts of sugar as that can also impede your immune system. Obviously, wash your hands often. Um, I think my daughter would probably consider me to be um, crazy in terms of having her wash her hands while we're traveling and sanitizing. We carry sanitizer and sanitize wipes. Um, teach your kids to use their elbow instead of their hand to push buttons. Um, uh, you can always carry Kleenex in your pocket if you're going to be grabbing um, bars, holding on to buses, um, that type of thing. You can just use the Kleenex kind of as a barrier to protect your hand from germs and try to keep your hands away from your face. Although if you have kids, don't tell them to keep their hands away from their face because they will automatically touch their face. <laughs> Do you guys have any any other things that you do just on, to stay healthy? You know, I mean, occasionally we'll wear masks, but if somebody's coughing, um, we had influenza hit the house about a year and a half ago with my daughter, and amazingly, my son did not get it, but we pretty much kept them on separate floors of the house, huh. um, um, made her wear a mask, made him wear a mask, a mask, tried to change the air supply pretty often, and um, it was kind of a crazy time. I felt like we were in some sort of strange camp where we were all detained, but, um, you know, we got through it. Good. And actually, I did add mask here on air travel, and 
Um, also, I added a resource for super um, soft masks that we'll talk about here in a little bit as well. So moving on to air travel, I think um, this is probably the most stressful for those of us trying to avoid germs. Um, so for, I always put this first, um, buy travel insurance. Um, and this might be overkill for some people, but for some families, it's not. I literally have used travel insurance probably four times in the last three years um, because I had booked travel for work or even for play, and um, my daughter ended up in the hospital or sick, and we had to cancel, and it saved us hundreds of dollars. And generally, for just air travel, it's maybe 15 to 20 dollars for insurance. Another um, thing to talk about is security. So you definitely want to plan ahead with um, by checking the TSA and your individual airline website regarding their rules on medications and medical supply regulations. Um, and I have those later in the resources, links to those. But they kind of change quite often. So it's always a good idea to check them before each trip. Prescription medications do vary by state. What they deem needs to be in an original container. Okay. We actually try to check this stuff out because when I, I just went to Florida a couple weeks ago, my donor actually got married. Okay. Um, so we took a trip to Florida. And I didn't take my medications in my original container because I had like 27, it would have been 27 bottles. It would have been an entire carry-on. I didn't want to waste it. Um, so I didn't do it at that time, but I you know, had to check the regulations to see if that was allowable in Minnesota where I was flying from in Florida where I was flying to. Um, and in that case, it, it worked out. I had a list like Kelly described earlier in another slide about the list of medications for my doctor and a note from my doctor saying I needed all these medications. Blah, blah, blah. And honestly, TSA, I think, is more terrified of medications than they are wanting to harass you about it. So it, it, it worked out well for me. Oh, good. That's good to know. We, Go ahead, Shannon. Exactly. Oh, we had one issue with traveling to New York. I kept um, the liquid prednisone in a 500 milliliter container, and there was probably only about 150 mils in it. Mm -hmm. But um, since the regulation was 300 mils or less, they had a big powwow about it, but then measured it and decided that it was within the limits, even though the bottle was huge. So I, in the future, I will just transition it down to an appropriately labeled small bottle. And I, that, that reminds me, Shannon, I took uh, a very, very large bottle of um, Kxalate with me on my trip to Florida. I don't know what the volume was, but it was well over 500 milliliters. Um, I did keep that in the original bottle, and they didn't have a problem with the size at all. So uh, just because of show, you never know, unfortunately, right now with TSA where you're going to go. I mean, they tested the bottle. They opened it up. They are very cautious about it, um, but they didn't have a problem with the volume in that particular one when it came to medications. So I don't know. Yeah, I think the gates are sketchy. You know, it just depends <laughs> who's on duty that day. I agree. Yeah. Well, this is all very good information, too, because um, – in my research, with on the TSA website, they actually have to let you through with your medications, regardless of the size of the bottle, which they probably didn't know, Shannon, in your case. Um, but it's all why it's important to check the TSA. So then you're educated and know, like, no, this on your website it said this was okay. Um, but again, it's always changing, so you never know. And um, like Jen said, either check the regulations of the place that you're traveling from and the place that you're traveling to, or pack all your medications in their original bottles just to be safe. Um, for some of us, you can see the carry-on luggage in the picture here. That was actually my daughter's, and it did take up a whole carry-on between all of her liquids and pills and syringes. So, um, but it's always important to keep it on your carry-on luggage, luggage um, and keep it with you because you wouldn't want to lose it for some reason and get there and not have it. That would be terrible. So um, we talked a little bit about the medical letter of necessity from your doctor. 
And this just makes your traveling through security um, less stressful because if you have that letter, you can whip it out and explain, no, this is why I have all of this. Especially if you're traveling with syringes, a lot of um, patients are on epigen or uh, Lovenox shots and um, they kind of get a little suspicious of syringes or bags. Um, I remember traveling with my daughter with um, bags of albumin, uh, IV bags of albumin, and it kind of, it's like a yellow substance. So it's, I'm sure it's something that they haven't ever seen. Um, so just to have that letter was super helpful. And then they didn't really, couldn't really question um, what it was that we were carrying on. Again, arrive early in case you are stopped by security, especially parents with kids who are traveling with the liquid medications. They're required, or at least I think they're required, to stop and actually test the liquids with the, the little test strips. Um, and so if you have 10 different medications that are all liquid, it's just going to take time to test all of them. Um, Shannon and Jen, what are some things that you've gotten stopped for in the past that held you up at security? Well, just that one instance of the medication, just the bottle size, that was the only time we ever had any issue. Okay. I, I haven't been stuck at all, honestly. I've had surprisingly great experiences when it comes to travel. That's where most of my fears were when it came to trying to plan a trip, but that's actually where everything has gone really well. Good. That's awesome. <laughs> it's kind of I know. I know. I'm just as shocked as you are. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I will never, I, I wasn't going to talk about this, but I'll never forget when I traveled with um, my daughter, Macy, by myself to Chicago. We were traveling from Colorado to Chicago for her transplant, but we had to travel with her peritoneal dialysis machine. And that alone was its own carrying case that weighed about 80 pounds. And then we had this carrying case picture below with um, all of her medications and then another carry-on case with um, various other supplies. And, and it took us literally a good 45 minutes to get through security. Um, every time they would put the dialysis machine that through, I would tell them, they would ask me, what is that? And I would say, it's a dialysis machine. And they'd look at me and I'd repeat myself, <laughs> it's a dialysis machine. And they would nod their head, oh, okay. And then we'd get to the next spot and we'd go through that whole process again. And, and we had to keep the dialysis machine with us even once we got onto the plane. So I literally felt like I said, it's a dialysis machine about 50 times before <laughs> we landed on the ground in Chicago. <laughs> so, um, it was slightly stressful just being a lot alone at the time, but otherwise we've never really had anybody question us. And I took actually took this off of TSA's website. Once in the security line, inform the TSA officer that you have medically necessary liquids, medication supplies, and try to separate them from your other belongings before the screening just so that they can see it all. And labeling all of the items is helpful um, in the screening process. There's actually also a little um, card that you can print out that I can't remember exactly what it was called, but it, it basically was a card that you can hand to the agent as they're checking your ticket to let them know that you have special medical supplies. And it's said in that information that sometimes they'll send you to a specific line in all of the security um, lines just to help you get through. I don't know if that will speed it up, but it will um, make it easier for you to get through. All right, so um, obviously you want to carry plenty of sanitized wipes and hand sanitizers. Um, I did see a question here just a little bit ago pop up. Um, and ask if you can get on the airplane um, ahead of time to wipe down everything. And the answer is yes. 
And um, I'll let Shannon and Jen share if they do anything in particular. Um, but what we've always done in the past is once at the gate, um, we go up to the to the person at the counter and ask for a pre-boarding pass. And um, I just explained my daughter is has a com um, compromised immune system. We really need to get on the plane and wipe everything down the best we can. Um, depending on who you travel, like a lot of times we'll travel southwest and you can choose your own seats. So we'll go ahead and get on super early and um, choose a seat that kind of is close to the front and keeps us away from as many germs as possible. And we'll go jump on the plane and wipe everything down, including um, the trays and the armrests and the seat belts. Um, so do you guys have anything do, that you do especially to kind of get on the plane early to sanitize? I mean, we pretty much go through all the same measures. I get the wipes out, we sanitize the tray tables, all the buttons, the light switch, the window shade, the window itself. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, I was horrified the first time I did it and I looked at the wipe, but um, yeah. anyway, made me feel like I was really doing something though. Yeah, exactly. I'm going to be honest, you guys, I don't do any of this stuff. <laughs> and you're I, I mean, so I, 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 this is very I think, well, this goes back to the risk of mercy, and I think in, in my brain, with everything that I've gone through, I just, for me, can't let it take over. Uh, and that this is my small little bit of rebellion, I guess. I think I have a seven-year-old who goes to, you know, second grade every day, and God knows what it is that she brings home on her shoes every day. Or I think of all the things that other people touch on an airplane before it even gets on the airplane, like the Coke can that your flight attendant gives you. It's just, right. I, I, can't, I can't sanitize it all away for me. Um, and I guess I just, I just go with it. I mean, I have, I have hand sanitizer, you know, I, I do it to myself, but as far as my, my locally surrounding area, I, I have not. But again, like, you know, that goes back to what, who's, how risk averse are you? And I, I, I feel that adults probably, I don't know why, I don't, it's not based on any science, but I feel like my immune system is probably, even after transplant, stronger than a, than a child's would be. So that's just, that's how I do it. I'm not saying it's the right way, but that's how I do it. Well, no, thank you for sharing, because I think it, it reminds us to have balance as well and not um, be overly aggressive in in removing germs from our children's lives. Um, yeah, I mean, and I understand for kids, you know, a fever can send a kid that's in remission out of remission in a heartbeat. It doesn't quite work that same way in adults. So I guess that's probably why I... I never had the same level of fear that someone like, you know, you, Shannon, or Kelly would have. It's a totally different situation for me. I may get a fever, but I'm going to bounce back pretty okay from it. Um, it's not going to send my world into a tailspin like it could possibly with, with you guys. Yeah. Very good information. Thank you very much. Um, all right. And then we talked a little bit about the masks. Um, if you are traveling during cold and flu season, it probably is a good idea to wear a mask, especially... Um, for children, if you're trying to avoid a relapse or cold and flu season, um, when we took Macy to Chicago for her transplant evaluation, it was March. So, and her um, her ANC, her immune system was fairly compromised because of rituximab. So at that point, we definitely made her wear a mask. And actually, I think her ANC was around 700. We actually had her wear gloves as well just because we didn't want to spend a week in Chicago in the hospital. Um, so again, it's, it's weighing your risk versus benefits. Um, and this was a question that came in um, on the registrations, what to do if someone near you was coughing or sounded sick. Don't be afraid to ask to move seats, if, especially if someone right next to you is sniffing or coughing. Um, just nicely explain to the stewardess or to the flight attendant that um, your, con your condition and ask if they would mind just switching seats. It's not that big a deal, and it's probably worth it, especially if someone sitting right next to you is going to be hacking on you for the next three hours. 
I've never ran into that personally. Have you, Jen or Shannon? No, but um, now that my son's in kindergarten, I've tried to, you know, let him know that it's not him being a bad friend if he has to move to the other side of the table if somebody's coughing and not covering their mouth or sneezing and not using a tissue, which most kindergartners don't have the best germ hygiene. So he just knows that he has to protect himself. And I mean, we'll be places where he hears another kid with kind of a wet sounding cough and he'll kind of look at me and then he'll just back up a couple steps. And so I know the message is getting through and and he's not mean about it. Like, ew, you're germy. I got to get away from you. But he's just, um, you know, he knows. He knows that he needs to stay away because being sick is really no fun for him either. Yeah, good point. All right, so public transportation, <clears throat> just several tips and tricks. Um, avoid peak times if possible when buses and trains are packed with people during rush hour, um, if at all possible. If you use public transportation for work or you're on a work trip, that's not always um, going to work out for you, but it's just a something to think about. Um, again, carry hand sanitizer and sanitize wipes. Um, I was thinking of Macy in Chicago after transplant when she was super compromised, but we still, we just needed to get out. And our only mode of transportation was the bus and the subway. We kept her, even though she was five at the time, I kept her in a stroller. I was just able to kind of, um, protect her from touching a bunch of things and kind of kept her in her own little bubble just um, by sticking her in a stroller. Um, you can consider wearing gloves if you need to hold onto the handles or bars when you're in the bus or the subway. Again, you can stick a Kleenex in your pocket and use that as a barrier um, or try to find a seat where you don't have to touch anything. Um, Use shuttles and taxis when available, although I'm not sure how clean they are. At least you don't have to um, be in droves of people and, um, again, touch buttons and bars and things. Um, and I stole this from the hospital. They have this policy where you're supposed to sanitize when you walk into a room and sanitize when you go out. So I thought, why not sanitize before you get on and sanitize when you get off? <laughs> it can't hurt. So. Um, those are just a few tips. Um, Shannon or Jen, do you have any anything you do in particular? That's pretty pretty. Yeah, that's pretty comprehensive. <laughs> You're awesome. <laughs> the other thing that I was going to add, and I never got back around to it, um, if we do travel and grab a rental car, I try to get in and at least sanitize the back seat where my daughter and son are going to be sitting. Um, similar to if we were getting on a um, on an airplane, although generally the rental cars are a little tend to be a little bit cleaner, um, and that might again be a little bit of overkill. All right, so moving on to international travel, and I'm going to have Shannon and Jen. Um, jump in a lot here just because I don't have a ton of experience with this. Um, this is probably definitely a time you'd want to assess your health and duration of travel um, and assess the risk um, of your disease exposure. There is a, um, sorry, I didn't mean to go on. Um, there's a resource here in a couple of slides. There's the CDC's website has a traveler's health map that you can type in your location that you're traveling to, and it will tell you any um, health advisories in that area. Um, it also connects you to various, um, oh, I lost the word. Um, oh, various customs, various um, countries' customs websites to check their travel rules and regulations as far as medications and supplies and also um, if there's any health alerts there. Um, definitely, if you're traveling internationally, want to talk to your doctor about necessary vaccinations, especially if you're going to more remote um, places. And a little bit about vaccinations. Every doctor is going to be different. Um, 
especially primary doctors, I would definitely tend to consult a nephrologist or if you've moved on to transplant your transplant team regarding which vaccinations are safe for you to receive and um, go from there. You might consider taking prophylactic medications um, if you're traveling internationally, um, if you tend to get frequent UTIs or kidney infections, you might want to take um, prophylactic antibiotics or um, there's this lovely thing called traveler's diarrhea that you might want to consider taking medications for. Um, all of those things you can talk to your doctor about. Again, you want to definitely um, obtain a medical letter of necessity from your doctor. Um, check with both U.S. and international customs um, as far as their regulations, because they're all different, even similar to Jen was talking about regulations within different states, and they change often. Here you definitely want to take more time to look into appropriate travel insurance to um, cover your travel cost in case you have to cancel, especially if you're paying a ton of money for this wonderful vacation and all of a sudden somebody gets sick and you have to cancel. Um, there's also... Sometimes, Go ahead. Kelly, I would, I, would, I would say here too, when it comes to travel insurance, you may want to check with your credit card company. If you use a credit card to book your airline, um, some credit cards actually have travel insurance associated with them, so it's something to check that might save you some money. I mean, you definitely need to call a credit card company to see if that's part of your particular card, but it is something to, to check out. Ooh, that's a good tip. I didn't know about that. Um, and there's actually different levels of, of travel insurance. I'm sure you all um, know a little bit about that, but um, you do want to talk with your doctor about out-of-country um, medical care and insurance for medical cost in case there's an emergency. Um, you definitely also want to consider medical evacuation coverage. So if you did if you did end up hospitalized and it was um, not just an acute thing where you're in and out, but you needed to be transferred back to the U.S., you can purchase coverage for that as well. And I do want to talk about this isn't like ne necessarily necessary for all of our patient families. Um, if uh, for Shannon, Ryan, probably even if he did go across the international travel and relapsed, um, chances are he wouldn't necessarily need to spend a whole lot of time in the hospital. Um, but he might. Um, but then there's some of our patients that are a little bit more complicated where if they get sick or traveler's diarrhea, they would end up in the hospital and with their kidney numbers completely out of whack. And it, it could get kind of scary if depending on where you were. So all of these things um, aren't necessary in all situations. Again, you want to seek counseling from a doctor regarding food and water safety, depending on where you're traveling. Um, but I would just say stick with bottled water. Um, you want to talk to them about the mosquito, insect, and animal avoidance, um, especially kids wanting to touch all these different animals, um, and then again, touching their face. And um, If you are spilling protein, you definitely want to talk about um, preventing blood clots, thromb thrombosis, um, if you're on an international flight that lasts hours and hours, you, you want to have a plan of how often to get up and move around and kind of limit your risks with blood clots. And then you also want to um, just consider high altitude sickness. I know we get um, visitors here to Colorado all the time that their vacation is kind of crummy because they get altitude sickness. And it's just something to think about. Um, definitely drink three times the amount of water you normally would if you're going to a place with high altitude. All right, and here you definitely want to develop a medical care plan. Um, know which appropriate hospital 
to go to if you need medical assistance um, and have your doctor type up a care plan of action should you develop a fever. So for many of us, um, if a patient or a child gets a fever, it's an automatic trip to the ER um, and there's a plan in place. They do blood cultures, um, just depending on, on their condition. So if there's that type of protocol here in the States, you definitely want your to have your doctor type up that plan um, so that you can give that to the doctors overseas. Um, so any, I'm gonna let Shannon and Jen kind of step in here and talk a little bit more about international travel. Sorry, I'm having a little person having a meltdown in the background here. Um, I pretty much didn't do anything beyond buy a really good extensive travel insurance and um, that include airlifting out if need be and um, that was pretty much kind of the extent of extra health planning that we did. Okay, great. Thank you. When it came to, for me, for, I mean, I, I actually ended up just delaying a trip uh, internationally while I was on peritoneal dialysis just because there were a lot of questions I had that I couldn't get answers to. Uh, for example, I couldn't figure out how I would get extra dialysate fluid if I ran out. You know, you I, I carry a two-day supply, but that's that was eight liters of fluid um, that you're carrying in a carry-on bag. You can't really carry much more than that. It just becomes physically prohibitive. So there were things that I couldn't answer, and I, I ended up having to delay a vacation just because of that. So. I mean, that, that, that may happen depending on what location it is that you're going to. It might just be in your best interest to delay until you're healthier in a different state. Right. Yeah, which is always super frustrating. But again, it's nice to know that we're not alone and not the only, the only people in the world that are having to plan vacations around a disease. So. Right. Does anybody on the call have questions about international travel while we're on this topic? Again, you can either raise your hand or you can type the question in on your toolbar. I'll go ahead and move on and keep an eye out for questions. We can always come back. Um, and here are the, just a few resources that I gathered putting this together. Um, this is the TCA. TCA, that's my, my daughter's school, um, the TSA security guidelines and disability, disability notification card. That's the little card I was talking about. Um, you can click on there and get instructions for that. Um, the CDC's traveler's health map seems like it would be a really helpful place if you're traveling internationally <clears throat> and just kind of let you know if there's anything important that you need to know about. I mean, um, I'm sure if you typed in Central America, you'd get a bunch of information about the Zika virus, that type of thing. Um, when I typed in travel within the United States, it took me to just the CDC current outbreak list, which is always nice to know if there's like a measles or mumps outbreak in a city that you're traveling to. Most of the time here, you're just going to find um, outbreaks of salmonella or E. coli, um, food-based illnesses. Um, but still, it's nice to know what you're heading into. Um, here's a website. The CDC talks about travel insurance, travel health insurance, and the, the medical evacuation insurance. Shannon was talking about a flight out if, you, if need be. Um, sorry, go ahead. Okay, sorry. And then, um, again, on the CDC talked about obtaining, um, sorry for the typo there, healthcare abroad. Um, if you're out of the country, what steps you can take to uh, obtain <clears throat> safe and um, good healthcare. Um, again, there's a link for the U.S. Customs and Border Con control that lists rules and regulations, um, but also don't forget to check the country that you're traveling to. 
And we talked about the masks. Um, uh, BreatheHealthy.com sells um, both adult and children's masks. And instead of being super scratchy with the paper, they're very soft on the inside. And they have this special um, fabric that protects from germs. And uh, they're adjustable earpieces. And I actually have purchased several for my daughter over the years. So I thought I would stick that on there because it's the only mask that she'll wear without complaining. So um, and we do have a question, um, how to assess disease risk in other countries in terms of diseases that are more likely to affect the immune compromised. Um, again, Shannon and um, Jen, jump, jump in if you have any suggestions here. Um, but you know, I mean, I, I think that any place with mosquito situation is probably one to avoid because mosquitoes just, I mean, they carry so many different diseases. But I mean, even our trip to Italy, we all got some sort of, we we're being really careful with the water and only drinking bottled water. And um, I don't know what happened. We went to a restaurant. I think our bottled water stock was low and, you know, we had a few sips of their tap water and within 48 hours, every single one of us had some sort of like stomach flu type situation going on. So, you know, um, next time I would know that, you know, we really have to stick to the bottled water and brush our teeth with it and no exceptions. Yeah, that's actually really good advice. I wouldn't even have thought about the teeth brushing. Yeah, I got this information from a friend of mine who's a physician, and he said that he takes a water filtration system that he bought at REI, and he says, I don't care where I travel. I mean, we, we use it for everything. We wash our fruit with it. We brush our teeth with it. And I thought, wow, okay. I guess being from India, you learn a thing or two about waterborne disease. Yeah. Wow. Um. I would probably add to just to um, piggyback off the water, um, avoid swimming in um, anything that wasn't salt water if I was out of the country, um, just to be safe. Um, I know, I, Jen, I don't, I'm not sure what the, your transplant team says about swimming in lakes and rivers and such post-transplant, but... Um, even if you're not post-transplant, avoid. I have a chest catheter, so we don't really talk about swimming right now. Okay, so you don't have a choice. But, um, nope. but avoid um, regular water where bacteria grows, um, maybe even hot tubs, That to, just to be extra careful um, while you're far away from home. Um, again, definitely check that CDC website. Um, and I would talk to a knowledgeable doctor about whether it's safe um, to risk traveling to that specific place. Um, I know there was also another question on the registrations that talked about a teenager going on a mission trip. Um, I can't remember exactly where she was headed, but definitely a third world country. And, um, just the implications of that. And I would say it's probably need to be discussed on a patient by patient basis. Um, my daughter has talked about wanting to go on a missions trip and I've basically told her, don't get your hopes up. We can find a mission trip within the United States <laughs> because I'm not sending you anywhere that doesn't have a hospital with pediatric nephrology services. So, <laughs> um, it kind of just depends on each patient and case by case. Um, moving on, there was a question um, about what's the best way to locate a good hospital while traveling. Um, I think I'm going to let Jen talk about this for adults. And even Shannon, you can jump in with pediatrics. But I think for children, the most important thing to do is just make sure that there's a specialty hospital nearby that has um, a pediatric nephrology program. Um, I, there's only about 80 pediatric nephrologists um, 
within the United States. And so not every state or city that you travel to is going to have those services. So you just kind of want to assess how far you're going to have to travel to get that. Um, and again, assess the risk. Jen, do you have any um, suggestions? I, I guess I guess for me, I mean, right now, especially right now post transplant, I mean, I'm not going to travel any place. The same like you that didn't have a hospital close by, and a big hospital, a good one. I mean, I've gone to a local ER here and been terrified about my own state of affairs because everybody in the ER literally freaks out when they see your numbers. Like you're not aware of how how bad your kidneys are already. It makes you very, very nervous when you've got nursing staff and, and random surgeons walking by trying to do things to you that you know aren't right. And that's just, that's locally here in Minnesota for Pete's sake. So I don't, I, I for me, wouldn't put faith in probably any hospital. I would, I would hopefully, in my documentation, my letter from my doctor, state this is what, you know, state this is what needs to be done if I become unresponsive or if I have a fever. Contact my local nephrologist. I mean, there's, there's not going to be any nephrologist anywhere in the country that's going to treat you better than your own right. um, in an emergency situation. Uh, so that's, I know that's what I would rely on. I'm, I'm not going to travel to some underdeveloped country at this time. It just, I, mean, I talked earlier about risk versus benefit, but and that that's not worth the risk to me yeah. right now. You know, if five years ago when I was relatively stable, I probably would have risked it, but I won't now. Yeah. Okay. Good to know. Yeah, and again, um, probably the best person to ask when trying to make that decision is your nephrologist because it kind of is a small network and um, most nephrologists have friends throughout the, the states and even worldwide that they would suggest um, <clears throat> if you were to travel. For instance, when we were planning our trip for my daughter to Disney World, um, we had set that's okay instructions um what hospital to go to what to tell them what again a letter to hand them that type of thing so shannon do you have anything to add um not really for this particular topic i mean we just i i think we we're lulled into a little sense of complacency our nephrologist is swiss Mm -hmm. And she was actually in Switzerland at the time visiting her mother. So I kind of had in the back of my head, if, we, if it really hit the fan, she's only across the border. <laughs> so um, <laughs> I, I kind of felt a little bit of comfort in that. And I mean, luckily, we've always been able to manage all the symptoms at home. Good. So we've yeah. been lucky to avoid hospitalization. Very good. You know, and, and, and Kelly, sorry, for me, like, you know, as an adult with FSGS, there isn't, there isn't anything disease-related that's probably going to land me in the hospital that would come up in an emergency situation, honestly. Mm -hmm. You know, like I said earlier, if I, if I get a fever, I'm not thinking I need to go to the ER. I'm going to watch it. I'm going to call my doctor, but most likely it's, it's, it's probably going to be a matter of manipulating the existing medications that I have. If you have some kind of infection, it doesn't matter. If you have FSGS or not, you should probably go get that seen. That's a little bit of a different story. So, right. um, again, it's just some common sense things, I think. Yeah. Great. Well, I do want to respect everyone's time. Um, but um, before we um, wind down here, I just want to touch on one more question. And that's just how we talked a little bit about drink. But how do you manage food and drink while traveling, um, especially if you're on a restricted diet? Yeah, this is hard. Well, I have to say that my snack bag kind of looked like Macy's medicine carry-on. <laughs> um, and my husband was kind of like, is this really necessary? And I said, you know what? It kind of is. We have a picky eater and someone who has to stay away from sodium and processed food. So, yes, this is completely necessary. So, yeah, a little overkill, but um, no one went hungry. Yes. That's really good. I worry about this, you know, like the next time I travel with my husband back to Sweden, you know, for example, post-transplant, I mean, you can't eat deli meat or anything like that. So that's a that's a big part of breakfast in Sweden is a, a smorgasbord of array of sliced meats. And I, I, I worry about this part. And, and, and also the low potassium 
possibly low phosphorus diet that some of you may be following. I mean, it gets it gets complicated, so it's really important to understand what those higher potassium or higher phosphorus foods are so that you can avoid them. I mean, you may not always have the luxury of having Google at your fingertips if you're traveling internationally mm -hmm. um, to be able to see that stuff just because of your data plan. So it's something to be really, really well versed in, I think. Yeah. We, we often joke that when in doubt, just travel with instant rice and, um, <laughs> <laughs> and plain popcorn. <laughs> so, there, there's your tip, but then you'd have to also have bottled water for the rice. <laughs> um, well, I just want to thank everyone um, for joining us. If anybody has any last minute questions, feel free to type those in real quick. Um, or if, if we sign off and something comes up, um, feel free to email me and we can always address them at a later time. My email is there at the bottom. Um, but again, I want to thank everyone for logging on and I, a special thanks to Shannon and Jen for giving your time this evening and sharing all of your experiences. We really appreciate it. Fantastic. Thanks for putting this together. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening.